No greetings all. Good to see you. Sort of, we'll see some of you anyway. I can see your eyes. I'm looking forward to coming to church again where I can see everybody's faces, but you know, that'll happen. That'll, that will happen. Statement of faith. John, that was an amazing prayer. It's like there was, I'd actually like to ponder your prayer for a little longer personally because uh, you put that together most magnificently. So thank you for leading in prayer. Leading in public prayer is actually a really difficult task. Uh, but I can tell you, John put a lot of thought into that, didn't you? Kevin. Did I say John? I did say John. Uh, the other thing I should say is I've forgotten some names, really. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. Have we got any Johns here? Are there any Johns here that I should be thinking of? Right. Sorry, Kevin. God knows your prayer better than I know your name. Hallelujah. Uh, that was, in all seriousness, that was, that was beautiful. So thank you for leading us in prayer. The wording that you chose there was, was yeah, really significant. I'd actually like you to pray that all over again because I'd like to listen to it a second time, but to mull on it a little bit earlier. So, yeah, good to see you. Um, uh, I think everybody knows who I am. Uh, so, Mark Wilkinson, uh, still um, doing similar things as when I was with you uh, four years ago now, a bit over four years ago. Um, still working at the BUV 30 hours a week in the church health uh, department, which is the role I went to, which I th continue to thank God for. It's a, it's a really fantastic role for me, as much as I miss pastoring. Uh, I just am so thankful for the role because it's the right thing for this season. Um, and I'm also a school chaplain. Uh, when I was with you, I think I was doing one day a week. I do two days a week now, to 10 hours a week, so that sort of juggles around, and I'm going to increase that to uh, 14 hours a week, which I'll just go to show that I'm a really good juggler. So... Uh, as I do those two roles. Um, people ask me about my family. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Lynn is, we sort of, we moved house three years ago, but we only moved about 500 metres, so we didn't really move very far. So, a slightly bigger house, which was helpful for the, the bedrooms. Got, the bedrooms shrunk as our kids grew, essentially, is what happened. So, we had to uh, make a little bit of a change there a few years ago. Um, so, Lynn's still working at a special centre, although he's just had to drop down from two day, for three days to two days a week. Uh, because her boss is, uh, is the COVID specialist at Werribee Mercy Hospital, so he's going to spend more time in the hospital, less time in practice. Anyway, that's boring. You're not interested in that. Uh, Mia is year 10, same age as, as the Robinson twins. They played, actually played volleyball against each other. Um, so it was like um, I was stalking them sort of thing. So I came to watch my daughter, and I got to stalk the Robinson twins at the same time. So, uh, so she's doing year 10. She's... She thrived in the last couple of years, to be brutally honest. She, she, she didn't mind hanging out at home at all, sort of thing. No stinky boys at home. Well, the brother, but, you know, but other than that, so she could just do it at, stuff at her own pace, and that worked out very well, and she's done very well academically the last couple of years. Happy to go back to school, but doesn't, never mind her working from home. Uh, alternatively, Jesse really struggled with the last couple of years because he was going to do TAFE, and TAFE got cancelled. And, like, the two years ago, TAFE got cancelled, work got cancelled, footy got cancelled. He had nothing. And so it was a really hard couple of years for him. But uh, he's now working full-time in a nursery, which uh, that's a good thing. So uh, we're happy about that. So uh, that's us, I think, in a nutshell. But it's, uh, as I say, it's good to sort of come back and hang out with you. Hello to those people who are watching online. Church is sort of, that's pretty weird work doing church online the whole time, wasn't it? It was sort of like, it's a challenge to be engaged. So try to be engaged, okay? Put your phone away, Okay. Don't play those games. You know why I'm saying that, because that's what I used to do <laughs> if, 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 uh, if it wasn't engaging. So anyway, uh, we'll be engaging. Miriam was engaging. My gosh, Miriam was engaging. Where's she gone? She's gone. So anyway, she's in, she was engaging. So we'll aim to be engaging today. Well, since Easter last year um, and the end of November... What I did in my daily Bible readings, I'm not quite sure what I was used to do with my daily Bible readings when I was with you, because I made a change a little while ago, and I can't remember whether I did it before or after I was with you. But so what I what I what I do in my daily Bible readings now, because uh, I used to, and I think maybe this is when I was with you, I'd like read some Old Testament, some New Testament, some Psalms and Proverbs on a daily basis. I had this fantastic sort of Bible reading plan that I'd sort of developed, sort of tweaked the one year Bible plan and, and made it work for me, and it was and it was great. It was great for a season. Uh, I felt like I needed to refresh it up and so I just started then actually 
changing, instead of reading a lot of scripture, I'd actually change it to reading a little amount of scripture and really trying to just sort of like, just really trying to stay with four or five verses a day or something along those lines and not quite read so much. And so what I, so for instance, so from Easter last year through the end of November last year, so that's a good number of months, six, seven, eight months, I slowly read through the book of Acts and the book of Genesis in my daily readings, okay? So I didn't miss many days, I hardly miss any days, but th- that's what I read. So you can get a sense of how I slowly I read those things and try those scriptures and trying to just sort of dwell on that and, and drill down a little bit more. And it was on Melbourne Cup Day when I read the words that have become pretty familiar to me from Genesis 41. If you have a Bible or a phone with a Bible on it, I'll trust you if you're going to open your phone that you're not just playing games, all right? Anybody doing Wordle? Anybody into Wordle? Does anybody know Wordle? A few of us are into Wordle. If you want to get into a good Word game, that's the daily Wordle game. Have you done it today, Karen? How many did you go? Uh, Four. Four. I think I did three today. Mm. Uh, so, did I call you the right name? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> so, Genesis forty-one. When, when I was preaching through these, uh, one you know Joseph's story in Genesis forty-one. It, most of you know a lot of it. Genesis 40, 41 There. Okay, well you, you got the whole head. I was going to animate all this, but you've got the whole. The whole, ga- the whole thing there. Two year, full years had passed there. Um, and so in Genesis, so Joseph's story is Genesis 37 through to 50. And so most of you have been hanging around church long enough, you know the basis of, of Joseph's story. You know, the Technicolor dream, uh, dream coat, etc. Uh, you know, this, whatever it was, it was something special. He was dad's favorite. A lot of favoritism went on in that family. Uh, and it was uh, un- unhelpful. And uh, and you know, really really difficult and caused jealousies and all those sort of things there and so we know that um, Joseph was taken down to prison sold as a slave part of his house Mrs Potiphar thought seventeen year old Blake looked pretty good looking and wanted a piece of him uh, with his integrity he said no gets put in jail for it and so goes off in jail a couple of the uh, couple of um, times go by. And we have Genesis 41, verse 1, where it says, when two full years had passed. And that's my Bible reading today. When two full years had passed. Because I reckon we are not supposed to go on into the next part of the story until we've pondered the fact that two full years had passed. Two full years of being of, of the incident that happened in Genesis 40 about the dreams that the cupbearer and the baker had and how both had come true. The, the story finished in Genesis 40 with uh, the cupbearer restored to Pharaoh's court as Joseph said he would be, and then the baker's outcome was not quite so good as Joseph had also predicted it would be and Joseph begged that he would be remembered remember me to Pharaoh and then verse 23 and I think we've got it up there the chief cupbearer however did not remember Joseph he forgot him and again let's pause on that Anybody know what it is to be feel forgotten? Feel like, you know, that you've, you've, somebody has let you down really badly? I guess most of us know what that's like, don't we, in reality. Most of us have been through that in our life somewhere along the line where we were forgotten, where we were left out, where somebody promised to do something and they forgot to do it. Perhaps even more confronting, if I'm honest, is the times that I've forgotten to do things that I said I would do and that I've forgotten to do things that, you know, and I've let people down and that's a really confronting thing when I think about the fact that I've forgotten things that I said I would do as well. I really try hard not to make promises I can't keep. 
It was a real challenge. You know, one of the pastoral challenges I used to have is, you know, you stand on the door, oh, would you, you pray for me this week, Pastor? Sure, I'll pray for you this week. And so I always just made a habit. Uh, no, I won't pray for you this week, but I'll pray for you right now. Because I probably won't remember. So let's pray right now. And so we pray right now. And so because I'd had too many times where I'd forgotten to keep promises about praying for people or doing something in those times. And so Joseph is forgotten. Two years of hope and expectation getting dashed bit by bit. As days go by, nothing happens. I want you to get back at that story. I want you to think about that, you know, that the, 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 the cupbearer goes back to work. He's restored. Who knows what time of the day it was? Well, let's say it was in the afternoon. Oh, I wonder if Pharaoh wants a glass of wine tonight and the cupbearer will have a, have a, bring him the wine and then he'll, have a, he'll, he'll, he'll remember my story and he'll say, oh, good to see you again, mate. How, how's prison? Yeah, it was great, Pharaoh. Thanks very much. Thanks for getting me back out again. But, you know, and he would tell about Joseph's story and Joseph's there waiting. And that night goes by and nothing happens. Oh, maybe Pharaoh didn't want any wine tonight. Maybe the cupbearer didn't wasn't needed. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night. The next night, nothing happens. Zero, zilch, nothing. Maybe uh, maybe I'll have a Saturday night party. I mean, people like party Saturday night, don't they? You know, people either, surely Pharaoh will want wine Saturday night, and they'll, and they'll want, want some of that. And so he'll want wine. Cupbearer will come. He'll remember me, and I'll get out. Nothing. Two full years of nothing. That's how I'd feel too. Two years in prison waiting. I don't know, has anybody else got anybody in my else? Can anybody else think of anybody two years in prison waiting? Anybody else spring to mind for anybody else? Anybody? This is an open question. You can, you can yell out an answer for me. Paul. I didn't, did that come from over here? Kevin, not John. <laughs> exactly right, Kevin. Because when, when I was thinking about this, my mind went back to July 27th, when I'd read e- almost the exact same words from Acts 24. And it says, Acts 24, 27, when two years had passed... It's like, interesting, the only word that's different is not the full. So maybe, he, I don't know, maybe he only got like 22 months or something along those lines. You know, when, when people say to me, oh, what's the age difference between your kids? Well, the reality is it's like 22 and a half months. But we just say two years because like, you know, you round it up. That's sort of reasonable and fair enough, isn't it? That you would round it I- in that way. So maybe it was slightly less. For that. It was maybe it was sort of roughly two years, but still it was the roughly two years since uh, Paul was on trial for some trumped up charges that the Jewish leaders had brought against him. It, see, it says, we had two year, years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left him in prison. Why? Felix was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talk with him. Now what we know of Paul, I don't think Paul would have minded that much because he liked talking to people about Jesus. He would take the opportunity, I'm sure, to talk. that. And Paul would have been smart enough to figure out what was going on. I mean, he wasn't going to offer a bribe. You know, you, don't you have to feel sorry for Felix on his Roman govern, governor's salary that wasn't enough for him, you know? Needed a bribe as well. Needed some more money. But again, we have here two years of being called in. Two years have been called in for spurious questions. Paul would have figured out what was going on. Two years to give him an opportunity to raise money for a bribe. And as I say, even worse for Joseph was he had two years of waiting for the cupbearer to remember. Now, this is why I think we've got to sort of dwell in the story a little bit. Because, like, most of us know the end of Joseph's story. Most of us know that, like, you know, he became 
governor and second in charge of the land and he you know he organized everything and he got the f you know he looked after the grain and the seven years of plenty stored it all up there and sold it again back in the two in the seven years of of um a famine that sort of followed on and all that sort of he got to back together his brothers went back you know and, th and it sort of almost has sort of a happily ever after story not quite but you know but again we've got to we've got to dwell in the story a little bit longer like because we sure we, we can sort of know don't we because again we're bible people you know we know the end of the story you meant it for evil but god meant it for good and it's New Testament equivalent is that we, again, we know this thing. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. And so we sort of know these, these stories, don't we? But what does it mean to dwell in the story? And here's our challenge to dwell in the story, to think about what that's like. See, because what struck me when I was reading the book of Acts uh, and reflecting on Joseph's story so reading the book of Acts on Cup Day and reflecting on Joseph's story that I read earlier, was it 2020 and 2021 have felt like two years on hold? You know, last week, January 25th, was the second anniversary of the first COVID case in Australia. Of course, it was in Melbourne, of course. Yeah, we like to be first. Mm. And so it's right for, to us to stand, for me to stay here, to stand here and say, for, our, for us, two full years have passed. And of course, for those of us in Melbourne, and you get to be included in it, it's times it's felt like being in prison, hasn't it? You know, free, where we didn't have freedom to move? Like, I could not believe that I would live at a time where I would have a nine o'clock curfew. Like, I thought I was back in primary school. <laughs> like, you know, that we were told we weren't allowed out after 9 p.m. That was, you know, I was sort of thinking like, that's like what my grandparents had to deal with in the war or something, of curfews and things like that. And now, sure, it's not prison. I, look, I know what prison is. I, I'm talking regularly with a, a guy who actually is in prison. And so I know what prison actually is. But there's a, th so many of our life freedoms were taken away. Am I right? Freedom to worship. when The, o the only thing you could do for a couple of years was to watch it on your screen. And, and it's not the same, is it? You know, I remember in those very first few weeks where we were watching online and like it's a great dilemma for the for the musicians and the and the you know do I'm sure that they you know put some music out there and I don't know I don't know what happened in your home but like in my home the first week or two I started to sing and then my family said please don't that's true. I'm not making that up. That's, that is actually true. Please don't sing. Because, like, it's disturbing for the rest of us. You know, God decided that I didn't need musical gifts. So, I like, I love coming to church. I love having skilled musicians sing over me. And I can sing well when they're singing over me. And, and that's good. I like it that way. But, like, ask me to sing out loud by myself or, you know, then, well, God enjoys it. But, you know... Most humans don't. And so many of the rhythms of life has, were put on hold. So many plans cancelled. So many holidays didn't happen. Who had to cancel a holiday? Good number of us. And in Melbourne, we set the record for the most locked down city in the world. Yay us. We went from the world's most livable city to the world's most lockdown city, didn't, did we not? I don't do well with delays. I, I'm, I have to confess here, I'm not, I'm not great with patience. Uh, you know, there are certain scenes, you know, I hate traffic. I really don't like traffic. I don't like stopping in traffic. I will go the long way around to avoid traffic, to, to avoid stopping. I will drive longer to avoid stopping rather than stopping because I just don't like it. Waiting waiting 
the favorite room in a hospital, hey? The waiting room. Oh, the waiting room. How long do we have to wait and wait and wait in the waiting room? Sometimes it seems eternal, doesn't it? Waiting for that PCR test to come back. We've all had PCR tests somewhere along the line, I imagine. Yep. Now we only have to wait 15 minutes for our rat test. I have to have them twice a week because I'm a school chaplain. I've got to go in there and have them twice a week and all that sort of stuff. I'll shove it up your nose. <laughs> you know, great fun, isn't it? Oh, dear, dear, dear. You know, some of you have been through the experience of waiting for a job. That's hard. Some people are waiting for a relationship. Some people are waiting to have a child. I know you know our story. We waited 13 and a half years to have a child. So many of us know what waiting is. So many of us maybe know what David was feeling when he wrote in Psalm 13. Uh, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face after me? How long must I wrestle with thoughts of my heart? We got that up on the screen there somewhere, Steve. I think we can go on there somewhere. There we go. Go to the next one as well. Uh, there we go. How long will you forget me? The key word in that verse, by the way, actually the key word is actually the third word in that prayer. It's Lord. Because at Lord, this means this is what the people of faith actually pray. It's actually, a, it's a prayer to God. It's saying, God, you're involved in this. I'm frustrated. Psalm 13 is, an, is one of my favorite psalms. Because it's sort of like those first two verses are about frustration. If you read Psalm 13, the next two verses are sort of the emotion has changed. And then the last two verses are full of faith. It sort of feels like, I wonder how long it took to write Psalm 13. You know, we tend to think, you know, maybe David just sort of wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down, and it just sort of came out in five, seven minutes. I reckon it took ages to write that Psalm 13. I mean, songwriters tell me that the song can take years to write. You have a little bit here and a little bit there, and you're refining it, etc., etc. Again, what this, this, what Jesus' words there to, to, um, uh, to Peter when he's coming along, and about to wash his feet. You know, I wonder if you felt like that. Lord, how long will it be? How long will it be before the breakthrough happens, before what this happens, before that happens? Kevin's prayer reminded us, gave us a global perspective of, you know, people in southern Sudan and China and India reminding us of that, that we've had a lockdown, but for them, it's a whole lot more serious. But we can feel like that. We can bring those prayer, th that prayer to him. So those two full years, those 730 days and counting, while it seemed like nothing was happening, something was happening. We, we sung this song earlier. I, I think that song, Waymaker, is a really interesting song. Let me digress a little bit. You know, most of the songs that we sing come from big churches in Australia, like Hillsong, or they come from America and some of those places, or a couple, you know, depending on where your favourite um, favorite people are from, maybe from England or something like that. The, the interesting thing about this song, Waymaker, is it comes out of Africa. In fact, it, even more interesting than that, it's actually a woman, an African woman, who's written this song. I think, and this is like, for my, well, my perspective, this is like the, almost the first song that has come to a very large global audience out of Africa and out of a woman songwriter. I mean, women have been allowed to write songs. They weren't allowed to preach often, but they could sneak their way in through songwriting. Many of our hymns from the uh, 19th century, women were never allowed to preach, but they wrote the hymns. And so, you know, got their way in through that way. God bless them. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, but I love this line. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even more for us in, in our modern world, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. That line in particular, in fact the whole song really, is a statement of faith. And when you're in the midst of waiting and not being sure and how long and all that sort of stuff, Making faith statements is good for your soul. You don't always feel like it, but it's good for you. It's good for you to be able to do that. 
even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Take that as a statement of faith. I remember actually when I was a school chaplain and of course we were having remote meetings and we had, I had a remote staff meeting because I was on sort of staff for through my chaplaincy at that stage. I've changed schools. Did I say that before? I changed schools my chaplaincy and so I changed employers. But, but I remember singing that song actually at school. You know, you're here working in our midst, which is a great, you know, it's easier to sing that at church. Yep, you're here working in our midst, but interesting to sing that as a school chaplain. You're at, you're at school, secular government school working in our midst. And I think that was a great statement of faith as well, to see that God was working in that place. I want to just sort of give a couple of minutes around this whole idea of just how do we deal with delays, and then I'm going to be done. I want to suggest to you the ways that we deal with delays. If we go to the next uh, slide, Penn Steve. We want to deal with faith. We recognize that God knows what he's doing, that he's working out his sovereign timing. For it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. And again, there's a, so that's a real statement of faith, and in, in it's times like this, you actually have to hang on to your statements of faith to believe that God is up to something, to believe that God knows what he's doing, to believe that God has going to be turning this and redeeming this in some way, say, or form. So we deli- deal with delays with faith. We deal with delays with an open ear to press into God and to listen. And just like the basketball coach to, who calls a timeout when he specifically, he, she wants to specifically speak to the players, so it is that God sometimes allows these things in our life so that we can press into him and to listen to what he has to say to us. Because often we race around and spend our life at a high pace and we don't have time to pause and to listen. One of the things that I now do as part of my daily rituals is I write in my journal every day three things I'm grateful for. This, this discipline, if you like, <laughs> didn't come from my church, it didn't come from my pastor, it came from my school principal. Because again, the school principal is trying to bring gratitude to students, you know, try to help them to think of the things that are good for today. And so every day when I pick up my journal, I, I, it's a discipline I have is to write three things I'm grateful for. You know it's a bad day when I'm writing... Thank you for the house that I live in. Thank you for the air that I breathe. And thank you for the food that I eat. If you wrote that in my journal, you think, oh, God, Mark's been really thankful. No, that's a bad day. I haven't got anything else to be thankful for, so I'm being thanking God for the basics of life. But, but pausing to give thanks, for finding things to be grateful for every day is a really good discipline for me. It might be something that you might like as well. Because it helps me to have it open here, it helps me to slow down, it helps me to operate in faith. And then with patience. With patience. We all, we all know that patience is one of the flavors of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc., so we know that the Holy Spirit wants to produce that in us and we obviously uh, patience can only be developed in times where we're feeling impatient. Am I right? Yeah. It's been plenty of those times, hasn't it? And it's interesting to look at the divergent paths of Joseph and Paul. When we think about this, when we think about what happened after their two years, we know that Joseph had the meteoric rise, did he? didn't he? You know, he got pulled out of prison, interpreted Pharaoh's dream, said, Pharaoh, you need someone who's really wise and really smart to put in charge of this because this is what's going to (laughs) happen. Put his own resume in for the job and was successful in the job and Pharaoh chose him. An amazing meteoric rise. Wouldn't it be wonderful if after the two years that we've just had that we all had these meteoric rises? Well, think of Paul. As best we know, he never got out of prison. He stayed in prison. He went off to, uh, went off to, 
we know we went off to Rome and had house arrest. That was sort of like what lockdown was for us, you know, house arrest. We weren't allowed to go out unless we were walking or buying food or it had, to, had to be home by 9 o'clock sort of thing. So we, so we sort of know what house arrest looks like these days. And so there's no clear path. One of the things that's important when you read the Bible is to understand what am I reading? And you both those, both Genesis and Acts are stories, a narrative. They're telling you the stories of things, people. It doesn't mean that your story will be the same. Because our stories are different. So that was quite different. So at the end of the two years, there's, so there's no guarantees of what things are going to look like here. What will 2022 hold for us? No idea. No idea. But the one thing I'm convinced of is that it won't be 2019 all over again. It won't be the one thing all over again. Go to the next slide for us, if you could. I want you to have a look at this picture on the left. In an ideal world, this would be really animated and this would look really cool. You know, we'd get one picture at a time, but just for imagine again. I want you to have a look at this picture over here on the left. I don't know, can, can those people on the, online be able to see that? Hopefully they will, they will. Tell me what you think has gone on in that picture on the left. This is feedback time. Y yell out to me what you think is going on. What's going on? You have to, but go louder, Kathy. The river has changed its course. It, it, indeed it has. This is the Cho Cholutica Bridge in... Honduras and after Hurricane Mitch in 1998 the hurricane was so severe and you can see that it looks like it was a fairly it's a not, not a you know not a really firm place is it but the whole river course had changed and it washed away the bridges thing the bridges um, um, ramps on either side the hurricane was so so significant and so so massive maybe even bigger than the storm that whacked your place when i saw you on the news that was pretty weird wasn't it watching the news and seeing his smiling face <laughs> there you go well you know he was still smiling so the bridge had, so and, and the engineers actually tested the bridge and the bridge is still in good order the bridge was still functioning the bridge was still like it still was solid the only problem was it didn't cross the river anymore. It'd be a mighty fine bridge, except it wasn't crossing what it was, wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And I just wonder if that's a challenge for us as God's people. That we, in our churches, that we've had a mighty fine structure and a mighty fine place that sort of worked reasonably well for a good period of time. But I want to suggest to you that in the last two years, the river has moved. The river has moved. We're no longer the same. The community is no longer the same. You know, two years ago, I thought Zoom was a Mazda commercial. <laughs> like, I hadn't heard of it. And then we just did everything on it for a, a whole lot of period of time. The world has changed. School has changed. Church has changed. The way we do business has changed. We do a whole lot more work remotely now. It's, it's changed. I, I want to suggest to you that the river has moved. Now, here's what they did with the bridge afterwards. Obviously, they still had the span there, which went over nothing, but they made a, they made a sort of a new span that went over where the river is now, and it's now the river. Now, the bridge is now functioning again. And I want to suggest to you that that's maybe what God's calling us to do as well. That we, what we adapt the old into the new, that there is an adaptation, there's some change that's, that's occurring. And this is really challenging always for us because it's al always hard to figure out what's the older thing that we need to maintain and what's the, what's the new thing that we need to adapt into. And if you know anything about church history, God's people have been wrestling with that for 2,000 years. And we continue to wrestle. And this pandemic that we've, well, I thought we'd live through it, but I think, we, I mean, you're still wearing masks, so we can't be all through it yet. It's changed things, hasn't it? That's why we can't go back to 2019. 
and think it will work again. The way that we did things, the way that we did our business, the way we did the radio station, I don't know. I imagine, imagine everything's changed. Well, certainly the way we do our church, the way we do life has changed. When I was here four years ago, I didn't have to worry about where, where a screen was or anything like that. We were just all here. We're all hanging out together. I can see your faces. But it's changed, hasn't it? So our challenge is to stay in the story, to listen to the Spirit, to listen to how God is leading us, to listen to what God is saying to us and how to go forward as God's people into that. And my prayer is that you'll know how to listen to God in that, listen together in that and figure this stuff out together in that and be able to work together as God's people in this sort of wonderful fellowship that's here at, at, uh, at Belgo South. Let me pray for you. We're going to sing a song and then I'm going to come back and lead you in communion. Okay, is that cool? Okay. Father, I want to thank you for these dear saints Lord, uh, who, who love you, who love their church, who are here trying to figure out how it all works and what it all means. So Lord, I pray that you would be blessing them and leading them and guiding them. Lord, for those who are watching on, on screen, Lord, I pray that they would know your, your presence with them in their homes or potentially even what they're, when they look at this later on. They'll know, know your presence and leading and guidance. So Lord, I pray that uh, they'll know that and be able to walk in those ways. So Lord, I lift this to you now and pray for this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Come and lead us.